Think about the coolest person in your school when you were a kid. I want you to think about the coolest person, the person you wanted to be. As I look around, maybe it was you. Maybe you were the coolest person in your school. If that's true, good for you. If it's not, think about the coolest person in your entire school. I'd even like to hear some of your cool person stories later. If you were in junior high with me, the cool person in junior high, the guy we all wanted to be was a guy named Owen. Owen and I went to school from the time we were in kindergarten till we graduated grade 12, and Owen was the man. Owen was the best athlete in our school. If you wanted a touchdown score, you gave the ball to Owen. If you wanted a goal score, you gave the puck to Owen. If you needed a basket, Owen got the ball. When we played baseball, we used to play on this diamond that was on the playground, and, and most of us couldn't hardly hit the ball out of the infield. Owen hit the ball onto the top of the gym roof across the playground. Like, Owen was the man. He was the dude. He was the cool guy around. Owen was the toughest guy in our school. He was one of the bigger guys. Nobody fought Owen. Other people fought. No one fought Owen. Everybody liked Owen. The girls loved Owen. Owen was the guy everybody wanted to date. And everybody wanted to be like Owen, so much so that I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but so much so that Owen, when he started wearing his watch like this, with a face on the inside like that, I did too, because I wanted to be like Owen. That was cool. <laughs> and when Owen stood on the basketball court and he was really, ex really exhausted, he'd stand like this. <sighs> so that's how I did it too. Because <sighs> I wanted to be like Owen. I wanted to be like Owen, because Owen was cool. Everybody wanted to be Owen. He was the guy. And you probably know an Owen in your life too, the guy that everybody or the girl that everybody wanted to be like, the coolest, the best, the one that everybody knew. That is the leader. If you went back a thousand years before Christ, there was an Owen in the Bible. If you went back a thousand years before Christ, Owen's name would have been King Saul. If you have a Bible today, I want you to look up 1 Samuel. We're going to tell a couple of stories about King Saul. King Saul was the man. King Saul was the most impressive guy in all of God's kingdom. Everybody knew that Saul was special. Even our introduction to Saul is, indicates that. If you've got your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 9, it says in verse 1 of that chapter... There was a Benjaminite. Benjamin is the name of the family that this man came from. There was a Benjaminite of standing whose name was Kish. Look down at verse 2. He had a son named Saul, an impressive man, young man without equal among the Israelites. This man was an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than all the others. Saul literally stood out from a crowd. Saul literally was impressive. He was huge. He was strong. Impressive there, the word that the NIV used that Saul was impressive. Some other versions will say he was handsome. He, was, he, was, he had valor. He was, he was the guy. They're struggling for a word to find out, to tell you how good he was. Everybody knew that Saul was special. He was the cool guy. And so when the Israelites begin to start looking around for a king, when they start talking <coughs> about what they're going to do for having a king, they want a physical king. When God finally acquiesces to that and decides, all right, I'll let you have a physical king, there is no choice as to who that king is going to be. Everyone knows it's going to be Saul. So in chapter 10 of 1 Samuel, we find out that, that Saul is made king and appointed king over Israel. Saul is obviously the leader. In verse 11, we find out that Saul doesn't only look good, but he's a good leader in some ways. He's, he's just absolutely courageous. We don't have time to tell this story today, but if you want to go look it up, chapter 11 of, of 1 Samuel, it tells about Sam, or Saul goes out and he leads the army and he, and he captures a whole city on behalf of this group that was hemmed in and couldn't get away from their enemies. And Saul is the guy who leads that. 
King Saul is the guy who says, we're going to go. King Saul is a man of courage. He is the one who's going to go save that city. King Saul is the hero. King Saul is the one that everybody looked to. He was a great military leader. He was strong. He was wise. He was confident. He was hardworking. He was effective. If we were to put it in today's terms, Saul was the star quarterback on the team. He was the man. Everybody looked to Saul and wished they could be like him. He did everything right. He had every advantage. He had been chosen by God himself. And everybody loved King Saul. There's only one issue. That if you go to the New Testament... And you look at Hebrews chapter 11, that great chapter about faithful men and women of God in the past, you will notice one glaring uh, omission. (coughs) King Saul is not listed. King Saul is not listed in the heroes of the faith. King Saul is not one of the ones they want to remember. King Saul is not there. The coolest, best, most wonderful leader is absent in the role of the faithful. And there are several reasons for this, but there's one outstanding reason. And you see it back in 1 Samuel, if you're still there. We've been in chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. Go to chapter 13. Chapter 13 tells us a story that illustrates Saul's major problem. And why he does not appear in the role of the faithful in Hebrews chapter 11. The story is this. The Philistines have decided they are going to come and attack God's people. The Philistines were a group of people that lived over by the the Mediterranean Sea. And they had a slice of land that kind of cut into the land that God's people held. And so they always had trouble with the Philistines. The Philistines were always coming after them. They were always coming to try and attack them. And so so they were always looking for defenses against them. And they were always looking to be defended. 1 Samuel chapter 13 tells about one of these stories beginning down in verse 5. It says, The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. So put that picture in your mind for a second. This is a time when most people don't have horses. They don't have chariots. The Philistines are showing up with 3,000 chariots. Uh, 6,000 charioteers. And soldiers so numerous that we can't count them. That's the army that's coming. We, We can't even count the number of people we've seen. This is their problem. And so it goes on to say this, that these soldiers that were so numerous went up and camped at Michmash, east of Ben-Avon. Verse 6, when the men of Israel saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, that's an interesting little phrase there, that their army was hard-pressed, because really Israel's army was almost nothing. Israel's army was just a drop in a bucket compared to what what the Philistines had at this time. Israel knew they were in huge trouble. There is no way we can fight these guys. They didn't have chariots. They didn't have weapons of war. They didn't have the things they needed. And so now they're they're becoming surrounded by the Philistines, and they're starting to get a little bit fearful. They're starting to get a little bit scared about what's going to happen next. It says their army was hard-pressed, And they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. This is the army of God. This is the army of Israel. Here's what they're doing. While the Philistines are lining up and saying, let's fight, God's people are running away. And they're hiding behind bushes and they're hiding in cisterns. They're hiding in the wells. They're finding places they can get away because they don't want to fight. They know what's coming. They know how things are going to be. Verse 7 of uh, 1 Samuel 13 says, Some of the Hebrews even crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead. 
Jordan River runs right through the middle of the land. It sort of formed the eastern border of God's people's land. And people were crossing the river to get away. They were deserving. They were running away. That's how scared they are. I want you to hear the next words in verse 7, though. It says, Saul remained at Gilgal. Gilgal is where the fight is going to happen. Everybody else is running away, but Saul is staying. I told you, King Saul was the man. King Saul is impressive. King Saul has some bravado. King Saul isn't going to run away. He's going to fight. He's going to stay. Nobody fights King Saul because he is the man. So he's there. He's hanging out and the troops are with him. But the writer adds one more thing. Samuel gives us one more little detail. King Saul stays, but it says that all the troops with him were quaking with fear. Everybody else is scared to death. Saul isn't, though. Nobody doesn't say that he was scared. He's ready to fight, because that's who he is. So, why isn't King Saul honored for this? Well, it says next. He waited seven days... The time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. That, that's sort of assuming you know something, so let me fill in the blank for you here. Before God's army went out to war, before they ever did anything like that, they would offer sacrifices to God. They would worship God first. Saul has received a message from Samuel saying this, Do not go to war until I show up. Do not go to war until I come and we worship God together. Do not go to war until I come and tell you that it's okay to start now. That is, that is the message Saul has received. So Saul, again, being obedient, has waited. In fact, he's waited seven days. He's waited an entire week for Samuel to show up so they can worship God, so they can go ahead and fight these Philistines. And all the time, his army is running away. All the time, his, his people are deserting him. The entire time, people are wandering off. And he's waiting. And he's waiting. And he's waiting. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And Saul's men began to scatter. Verse 9. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Here's Saul. Again, he's the guy. I'm the leader. Everybody's following me and they're all scared. So here's what we're going to do. We're not waiting for Samuel anymore. Samuel is the guy who's supposed to give the offerings because he's the priest. But we don't have time for that anymore. I've got to get something done, Saul decides. Saul is a man of action. Saul is a man who says, I'll take this into my own hands. Bring me the sacrifice. So Saul takes the sacrifice, and he offers it himself. He does the worship. He decides if nobody else is going to be here to do it, if Samuel's not coming, I'll take matters into my own hands, and I'll just get it done, and I'll do it. No big deal, right? We're still worshiping God. We're still honoring him. And Saul has got something done. Because that's who Saul is. I will push this thing forward. And I will get this battle started. And we'll beat those guys. Because he is the man. Read the very next verse. It says that Saul got up and he offered the offering. Verse 10. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrives. Saul went out to greet him. Saul is pretty proud of himself here. He, Samuel's arrived. Okay, Samuel, that's fine. He finally showed up. But guess what? We're already done the worship bit. We're all done that part. You can go home now. Saul goes over to greet him and tell him to go home. We're about to go to war. Samuel asks him a question. Verse 11, what have you done? Samuel looks around, he realizes, he knows, but he asks him, he wants to hear from King Saul. Listen to Saul's response. This is the response of a guy who knows who he is. This is a guy who knows he's the leader. This is the guy who knows he's important. This is the response of someone who's not questioning himself. His response is logical. 
His response makes some sense. He says, When I saw that the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines are going to come down against me at Gilgal, and I've not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. That's what I did. You weren't here. You weren't doing your job. I'm the leader here. I'm the one everybody's following. So here's what I decided. They're coming after us, and they're running away, so I'll offer the sacrifice. I'll do it myself. Nobody else wants to do it. I will push this forward. So I did that. I offered the sacrifice. That's his explanation. Makes some sense. He's the man. He's the leader. He's the one. He should do that. He should take the initiative. He should lead the way. He is the king. It all sounds great. Makes a lot of sense. Way to go. You're a brave, solid leader. Except for Samuel's response. Very next verse. Verse 14. Or sorry, verse 13. Here's the response from God's leader. Verse 13, Samuel says, You have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God that gave, he gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom for, over Israel for all time. Listen to verse 14. But now your kingdom will not endure. What? So King Saul has only done what he thinks is necessary. He's only done what he thinks he ought to do. He tried to honor God. And Samuel looks at him and says, you've done something really foolish here. You didn't obey what God told you to do. You didn't wait the appropriate time. You didn't wait till I showed up. You couldn't wait. You were going to just charge ahead anyway. And because of that, God, who would have made you faith, <coughs> Fruitful forever. God, who would have established your kingdom forever, has now taken it away from you. You've lost your throne, Saul. You've lost your whole position. Everything is gone. You blew it. You blew it. And the question has to be asked, what did he do? What did he do that was so bad? What did he do that, that was so... He wanted He was just trying to push the thing forward. Listen to the very next thing Samuel says to him. God would have, been, would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time, verse 14, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Those of you who know the Bible well, God has just rejected King Saul and he's just chosen David man after his own heart. Now, when I look at Saul, I think to myself, well, what did he do? Like, what's so bad? What, what's so wrong here? He was just being a leader. He was just making sure things happened. He was just pushing things along when things needed to be pushed because everybody was running away. What did he do that was so wrong? The issue is, is that Saul trusted himself and what he could do. Saul was used to being the guy. He trusted himself. He thought he was pretty tough. He had everybody's admiration. He knew he could do anything he wanted. He could get things done. Saul trusted himself. His problem was he should have trusted God. His trust in God was not enough to make him wait his belief that God is going to solve that Philistine problem isn't enough to make him wait. His trust that God has things in control isn't enough, so he can't wait. He panics and decides, I've got to solve this. I've got to fix this. I've got to make something happen. I've got to do it. It's on me. It's up to me and my strength. I'm going to go forward with or without God. And his trust was misplaced. And so when God looks at him, he says, boy, you're impressive, but you're not my man. You don't trust me enough. The evidence of this is very clear. If you're taking notes, you can see it. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 11, when Samuel was chosen to be king, or Saul was chosen to be king, it said that God's spirit came to him 
After this incident, verse 5 of chapter 16, it says, God's spirit left him. And that's the difference. Saul had been picked and blessed by God. Saul had every advantage. But Saul didn't have a trusting heart. He trusted himself. He led, but he led by his own strength. He, he did what he wanted to do by what he could do. He didn't consider enough, at least, what God was going to do. And what God had planned. And what might happen. I teach you in every lesson, you've got to ask, so what? That's an interesting story, possibly, but so what? What's the problem? What are we talking about this for? Here's the point I want you to think about. Here's the thing I want you to roll around in your own head. I want to suggest to you that too often, we make the same mistake. Too often, we act as if this is on us. That if anything's going to get done, it's going to get done because I've done it. It's going to get done because I've pushed it. It's going to get done because I'm in charge or I've made a good decision or I've been the one who manipulated things to make them work. It's on me. It's up to me. I'm here to lead. I'm here to push. I'm here to get something done. I'll do it myself. Just think about any time we start talking about evangelism. Anytime the church starts talking about evangelism, what's the first question we ask? What can we do? What can we do? It's the wrong question. And it betrays something within us that is still not quite figured out yet. It betrays what was wrong with, with King Saul. He thought about what I could do. What can I get done? What can I make happen? And yet, that's not the question for God's people. That's not the first question, at least. If you jump over to the New Testament, I want to take you to a passage that's quite familiar in, in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is about to send his workers out into the harvest field. He's, he's, out, to, he's out to send people to evangelize. He's out to get people to go out teaching the word of God, right? And, and he's sending them out with this job to go out and teach other people about God. And, and when Jesus goes to send them, he gives us this famous little phrase. He says, he compares it to a harvest. And he says, you know what? The harvest is plentiful. When Jesus looks out, he looks out and he says, I can see all kinds of people who would respond. The harvest is plentiful. It's ready to be brought in. There's all kinds of things that can happen, all kinds of good. It's plentiful. We're ready to go. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. In this, in this passage in, in, Matt, in Luke, when Luke records this, he records Jesus telling the people to go. I want you to go into the harvest field then, because the field is plentiful. The harvest is ready. You guys go. But we miss something when we read it that way. I've always kind of read it that way. Jesus says, man, the harvest fields are full, the workers are few, you better go. And I say, oh, I better go. I get myself tuned up, I better go, the church better go. That's how we read this, right? But we miss a really important part. Jesus didn't say, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, so you better go. That's not what he says. Read it again. Read what he actually says. He says, the, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, what should we do then? The answer is, he says next, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into the field. Do you see the difference? Jesus doesn't say there's a harvest to be gained, so go do it. That's not what he says. He says there's a harvest to be gained, so start praying. Start praying that God would send you. Start praying that God would open the door. Start praying that God would make something happen in that harvest field. Start praying that God would use you. The action to begin with is prayer because this is God's harvest. This is God's field. 
This is God's church. And if anything's going to happen, it's not going to happen because I'm the smartest or the brightest or the best. It's not going to happen because I'm a superstar. It's not going to happen because I've done everything correctly. It's not going to happen because I'm the most popular person everybody knows. It's not going to happen because of those things. It's going to happen because we trust God enough to say, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? Where do you want us to start? I'm asking you to send me. It starts with God. And that's a completely different starting point. Somebody once said this. It's possible to build a church by relying on our gifts and our talents and our experience. It is possible to do that. It's possible to build the church with just our own abilities. Jesus doesn't say that you can't build the church without him. He didn't say that. In fact, that passage in Matthew says lots of people will do lots of things that don't know God at all. On that day, you'll say, boy, I healed people and sent people out and did all this stuff. And he'll say, I never knew you. You can get a lot of things done just by your own pushing. <coughs> but, he, but what he does say is that if you build a church with your own efforts, they will mean nothing. The only way this is ever going to mean anything is that if it flows out of a relationship with him. The only way it's ever going to work is if we're trusting God. The only way it's going to work is if he is the vine and we are the branches and then we produce his fruit. It's the only way it's going to actually work. So for too many years I've seen churches try and do things on their own and then they pray when they get in trouble. The starting point is not, what can I do? The starting point is, Lord, send me somewhere. Lord, help me be a harvester. Lord, I'm trusting you. You're doing the work. I'm willing to go. That's the starting point. And that's what it should be. A guy named Francis Chan once said that prayer is not, the only, not only a task of ministry, it is the gauge that exposes our heart's condition. I think that's true of me. The times when I'm trusting myself the most, I pray very little. The times when I think I'm in control, I pray very little. Except maybe the obligatory <laughs> prayer that God would bless whatever I've already planned to do. I don't think that's the type of prayer we're looking for. The type of prayer that we are looking for is one that says, I am ready, Lord, send me, show me, help me, open the door. That's the thing Paul prayed for all the time, right? Paul writes to several of the churches and says, pray that the Lord would open a door. That's what he wants. That's what made him effective. That God opened the door, not him. That he was trusting God's power, not his own. That's a different starting point. To me, this is really good news, though. To me, this is really good news because not most, most of us are not Owens. Most of us aren't superstars. Most of us can't just stand up and lead a group of people. We're not going to be those people. We can't make something happen here. But the good news is, is that God can do anything. And so if I'm praying for him, and if I'm praying for my friends, and if I'm praying for this church, and if I'm praying for the gospel, and if I'm praying for salvation, for es people in Estevan, if I'm praying for those things, then who knows how he might use me? Who knows what, what door might open? Who knows who might be reached? Who knows where his word might go? It's a hopeful thing, because I don't have to be the star. God gets to be the star. And we attract people to him and his son and his spirit rather than to us. And that's where it's supposed to be. The Apostle Paul, when he came to the Corinthian church, uh, he, he used the exact same method. Paul says, it wasn't about me. I wasn't the superstar. The passage that, in, that encapsulates this thought is from 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. He says this, for I determined not to know anything among you save Christ Jesus and him crucified. I didn't want to even talk about anything else. Jesus and him crucified. That's what's on display. That's all I want to talk about. 
And it was not, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So I, I wasn't that impressive. In fact, my, my speech and my preaching was with, not with convincing words of man's wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power. I didn't come with a great eloquent speech. I came with God. I didn't come with great, wonderful things for you to see. I came with Jesus on the cross. For one reason. I did this for one reason, so that your faith would not stand on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. King Saul was a powerful man. He got a lot of things done, but he trusted himself too much. He thought he was the engine that drove things. King David comes along next, and he makes a pile of mistakes. But he loves God so much. He trusts God so much that God says, there's a man after my own heart. There's someone I can use. There's someone I can talk to. There's someone who can be effective. And God used David in incredible ways. Brothers and sisters, we have a choice. We can push, or we can start with prayer. We can trust our own smarts and our own instincts and our own abilities, or we can trust in a God who can do much more than we can ever dream. Brothers and sisters, can we become a praying church, a really praying church? church that prays for our friends that prays for this town that starts off believing that if we're praying god will open a door brothers and sisters let's be david and not saul stands <laughs>